What would you do if you found something abandoned in a box on the side of the highway? I'm Felicia Huffman, and this is Macabre at Midnight. Welcome back to the second episode of Macabre at Midnight. And Leslie's back, back with us. Hello. So do you have anything to say, or would you like me to jump into this story? You can jump right on in, darling. All right. It's 1957 in Philadelphia. The citizens swoon over Elvis. Puxatawney Phil predicted a long winter, and they danced in the new year with Mummer's Parade. But nothing could have prepared the city for what they would discover on February 25th. A muskrat hunter was checking one of his traps he had set up near a park. As he was looking through the bushes, he found an old J.C. Penny box. Inside of it, he found a child wrapped up in a blanket. Fearing that the police would confiscate his illegal traps, he left and didn't t- tell anybody about his findings. A few days passed. This time, a college student was driving by the same area when he noticed a rabbit hopping through the field. He knew that there were traps there, so he stopped to make sure the rabbit was okay. He searched through the bush, checking for traps, when he found the box. He was also a bit apprehensive about informing the police, but he did the right thing. This stretch of land was northeast Philadelphia, in northeast Philadelphia and was known as Fox Chase. There were no houses in the area, but there was a c- compound for the Sisters of the Good Shepherd. They were a religious group that operated a home for wayward girls. The space right across from this group home was a wooded area covered in thick underbrush. This was where residents would often throw out their refuse, and it was here at the junction of two well-worn footpaths that the boy was found. Once the police had taken over, they estimated the young child to be around four to six years of age. He had a full set of baby teeth. The ultimate cause of death was said to be severe trauma to the head, but they could tell that his body had sustained years of abuse. He was 40 and a half inches long and weighed 30 pounds. He was malnourished and covered in bruises. The bruises were all sustained at the same time. He had a total of seven scars on his body. Three of the scars could have been caused by a surgical procedure. Two of these surgical scars were on the chest and growing. Both of these scars had healed very well, leaving behind only a faint line. Another scar was on his left ankle and appeared to be a cut-down incision. A cut-down was made to expose a vein to insert a needle into for a transfusion or infusion. A cut-down was typically done in emergency situations and has since fallen out of favor for safer options. There was also a one and a half inch scar on the left side of his chest and a round irregular scar on the left elbow. He had an L-shaped scar under his chin and a smallpox vaccine scar and he was circumcised. The police assumed, considering it was a young child, that the cause would be that the case would be solved fairly quickly. At the very least, they figured they could find out the identity of the boy. After all, a child rarely goes missing without somebody noticing. But as the days turned into weeks, no one stepped forward to identify the boy or claim him as their own. The body had been cleaned and dried. They had carefully folded the boy's arms across his chest, and his fingernails and toenails had recently been trimmed. His hair had also been cut, but in a crude and hurried way, as if they were trying to conceal the boy's identity. There were clumps of hair on his body, which suggested that his hair had been cut while the boy was nude. This meant that it was likely cut shortly before or after his death. The bottoms of his feet and the palms of his hands were wrinkled and rough, which the police called the washerwoman effect. This means that just before he died, his hands and feet had been submerged in water for an extended period of time. An ultraviolet light shone on the left eye showed a bright blue, showed bright blue, which suggested that a special diagnostic dye had been applied, possibly because of a chronic eye ailment. He also hadn't eaten for two to three hours before his death. Due to the cold weather, they couldn't tell exactly how long the child had been dead. It could have been a few days or upwards of a couple of weeks. The only evidence they had was the box he was in, the blanket that was used to wrap him up, and a man's cap. The box came from J.C. Penney's, so the investigators thought that they might be able to learn something from it. The box was stamped fragile and had held a bassinet. The box that held the boy was in decent shape. It was dry inside and slightly damp on the outside and appeared a bit weathered. The FBI analyzed the box, but nothing was found. 
The cheap faded flannel blanket the boy was wrapped in appeared to have been washed recently. At one time, the blanket had been mended using a home sewing machine and it had been cut in half. The blanket was sent to Philadelphia Textile Institute for testing. They determined the blanket had to have been made either at Beacon Hill in Swannanoa, North Carolina, or the Esmond Mills in Granby, Quebec, Canada. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. However, they could not figure out the point of sale for this blanket because several blankets of that kind had been made and shipped throughout the country. The man's cap had been found about 17 feet away. It was made of corduroy and was blue with a leather strap and buckle on the back. It was stuffed with tissue paper, just like a manufacturer would use to keep it, to help it keep its shape. The FBI did not find anything of value on the cap. However, the label on the cap led the investigators to Robbins Bald Eagle Hat and Cap Company. They spoke with the owner, Miss Hannah Robbins. She told them that the hat was one of 12 she had made from some corduroy remnants sometime before May of 1956. They found a few other pieces of evidence, a white handkerchief, a child's tan scarf, yellow flannel shirt, black pair of shoes, a torn piece of blanket, and a dead cat wrapped up in a man's sweater. A dead cat? <laughs> yeah. Yep. They were grasping at straws. <laughs> The handkerchief did not supply them with any information. The scarf and shirt could have belonged to the boy because they were the right size for him. They had hoped the shoes were his as well, but when they put them on him, they were way too big. While they initially thought the blanket found with the cat was part of the same blanket the boy was wrapped in, analysis proved it wasn't. There were no matches between the items with the cat and the boy. Besides the bruises, there was not a lot of evidence on the body. There was a brown coating on his esophagus, that they could not figure out what was. But it is consistent with him having vomited right before he died. They also took his foot and fingerprints to try and match them to hospital records. After an exhaustive search, they never found a match. The local paper distributed over 200,000 flyers, and they even stuffed the flyers into electric and gas bills. The police even tried staging the boy in a seated position to make him look more natural in the hopes that somebody would recognize him. The first suspect was the 26-year-old college student who told the police about the body. Frederick J. Benoit, he called the police just after 10 in the morning on February 26th and told them about the body he had found the previous day. As it turned out, he had not let the police know about the body on the day he found it because it, he was in the habit of spying on the ladies at Good Shepherd School for Wayward Girls. What had changed his mind, though, was a radio broadcast a minute about a missing child from New Jersey. The police questioned him extensively, and he also voluntarily took a lie detector test, which he passed. This cleared him. George Brumall, Marine Private First Class, had just recently returned from overseas. He told the police that he thought the boy was his missing eight-year-old brother. This belief was renewed after viewing the body in the morgue. George was one of 18 children. Whoa. <laughs> he had last saw his family when they were living in Philly. During this time, they were getting ready to move to the West Coast, but the two younger children were left with one of the older brothers who lived in the northeast area of the city. But they eventually found the missing brother alive and well in California. Do they know how he ended up in California? That's where his parents had moved to. Gotcha. Stephen Craig Damon was the son of an airman that was stationed in New York and was kidnapped outside of the supermarket on October 31st, 1955, at the age of 34 months. Stephen had blonde hair and fit some of the similarities to the boy in the box. This led the investigators to send footprints to the Nassau Police Department in New York. They also took x-rays of the boy to try and find known characteristics that Stephen had. But the x-rays and the footprints did not match up quite right, which created doubt that they were the same boy. The unknown boy did not have any healed fractures, but Stephen would have had a filled, healed fracture on his left arm. Stephen also had a freckle on his right calf, which the boy did not have. What really proved that they were not the same boy was the autopsy performed by the chief medical examiner, Dr. Joseph W. Spellman. Stephen was being treated for a kidney growth problem, but the boy had normal kidneys. After conferring with the detectives from New York, it was concluded that the boy was not Stephen Damon. 
Kenneth and Irene Dudley were traveling carnival workers. They were arrested and jailed in Lawrenceville, Virginia in 1961 after they caused the death of their seven-year-old daughter from malnutrition, neglect, and exposure. After questioning, the Dudleys admitted to allowing six of their ten children to die from neglect and malnutrition. Oh my they god. Had... <laughs> They're wonderful people. They had disposed of their bodies in many southern states. They tossed two of them into a lake and another had been dumped at an abandoned phosphate mine. And this is why I don't drink fresh water. Out of streams and crap, you never know what people dump upstream. <laughs> oh, yeah. The investigators did a thorough investigation of the Dudleys and found that they had no connection to the boy. Arthur and Catherine Nicoletti operated a foster home one and a half miles away from the, where the boy's body had been discovered. Another girl who lived in the house was Anna Marie Nagel, who was Catherine's daughter from another marriage. There is some hearsay evidence that suggested that Anna Marie was mentally challenged. Catherine had given birth to four other children, three of which were stillborn, and one boy died tragically at the age of three after being electrocuted on a department store ride. The Nicolettis took in children from the state and city for weeks or years at a time. They typically had five or six at one time. At the time of the boy in the box's discovery, they were caring for five girls and three boys. All of them were checked and accounted for. The police didn't think they were involved in the case. But we'll get back to them a little bit later. Dun, dun, dun. Remington Bristow, in the 1960s, started investigating this case on his own. He wasn't having much success, so out of desperation, he spoke with a New Jersey psychic, Florence Sternfield. Florence said that she could identify the person if she could hold onto a piece of metal that was connected to him in some way. He took her some staples from the J.C. Penney box. Florence told him that he needed to look for a large house with a wooden railing and a log cabin on the property that children were playing in. Bristow searched the Fox Chase area for this house and finally found the foster home. The property had a log cabin in the back that the children slept in during the summer. Bristow returned to Florence and took her to Philadelphia. She claimed she had never been there before, and then she led him straight to the foster home that he had found. This made Bristow believe that she had been right and these people were involved in the boy's death. In 1961, the Nicolettis had left the foster care business and moved away. Bristow went to a viewing of the home with its furnishings and noticed a bassinet that was similar to the one sold by J.C. Penney. There was also plaid blankets on their clotheslines, and the blankets had been cut in half in order to fit onto the cots for the children. They also had a duck pond on the property, which Bristow thought could have been where the boy's hands and feet had been in water. Bristow felt for years that this family had something to do with the child's death, but try as he might, he could not sway the detectives to reinvestigate the family. Finally, in 1984, a couple of homicide detectives agreed to interview Arthur Nicoletti. The interview turned up nothing incriminating. Surprise, surprise. Bristow was pretty upset by this and contacted Arthur himself and urged him to take a lie detector test. Arthur refused. This made Bristow believe that he had something to hide. Bristow still believed the Nicolettis had something to do with the boy's death and even theorized that the boy had been the illegitimate child of Anna Marie. This belief was reinforced when Arthur Nicoletti, now a widower, married his stepdaughter. Bristow was going through some old files in 1988 and found that the doctor who had checked the foster children had never formally been interviewed. Bristow hoped that the doctor's files would contain something about the boy. He reached out to the doctor's wife and she told him that she had, five years earlier, burned the doctor's records. Until Bristow died in 1993, he never stopped believing that the foster family had something to do with the boy's death. Unfortunately, he was never able to find the evidence to prove such a theory. There were several other theories about the boy and his identity, but the next substantial lead happened in 2002. A woman reached out to police through her psychiatrist. She claimed that her abusive mother had purchased the boy from his parents in the summer of 1954. She said her mother subjected him to extreme sexual and physical abuse for a couple of years and ended up killing him in a fit of rage by slamming him into the floor after he threw up in the tub. 
It's believed that she told her psychiatrist this in 1989, but was not willing to come forward for another 13 years. In May of 2002, Augustine, along with two other detectives, interviewed the woman for three hours in her psychiatrist's office. She said that in the, in the 50s, she had lived in Lower Marion, and her parents worked in the Lower Marion School District. Her father taught science, and her mother was a librarian. She said the boy's name was Jonathan and described him as a frail, mentally handicapped, and unable to speak. When she was 10, her mother took her to a house and picked up Jonathan. She said that her mother regularly sexually abused her, that her mother wanted Jonathan in order to do the same thing to him. Jonathan was mistreated for two and a half years before his death. When her mother killed the boy, she cut his hair, trimmed his nails, cleaned him up, and wrapped him in a blanket. Her mother took her along with her to dump the body. Once they found an appropriate place to dump him, they got out and was getting ready to unload him from the trunk when a man pulled up and asked them if they needed anything. They turned their back on him and didn't say anything, making sure to cover the license plate. The story matched very closely to a confidential testimony by a witness who had reported this incident to police back in 1957. After the man left, they unloaded the body and placed it in a box they had found on the scene. There was no mention of her father in all of this, so what kind of role might he have played? And if her mother did do this, why didn't he stop her? The police felt the story was plausible but they were also concerned with the fact that the woman had a history of mental health problems, so she could have fabricated the story. They launched into an investigation, but as of yet, they have not found any evidence that corroborates her story, but this theory has not been proven wrong. Despite all of the leads and anonymous tips that the America's Most Wanted broadcast garnered in 1998, nothing substantial has come of it. The boy remains unidentified, there's quite a few more reports and leads that you can read about on americasunknownchild.net. Could it have been the foster family or maybe the woman with the abusive mother is telling the truth? It's very well possible that one of the leads we've talked about that the police didn't think was a good idea could have been the killer. Will we ever find out the identity of America's unknown child? Nobody knows. Your thoughts. Why does that sound like a Criminal Minds episode? <laughs> like that was a roller coaster, man. <laughs> Do you think it could be the boy that was bought? You think that's a true story? But I mean, she was seeing the psychiatrist, so that makes her story a little hard to believe. Yeah, I think that's a problem that, oh, well, you're seeing a therapist, so you're crazy and making up things. Um, but Not she was, saying that if you take therapy, you're crazy and you make up things, but back then it wasn't as yeah. know, accepted as it is today. Well, Emily, the police talked to her in the early 2000s. Um, I mean, anything's possible. Because if her mother was that crazy and abused her like that, as well as the boy, that makes sense for her to be in therapy. Exactly. I personally believe the Nicolettis had something to do with it. But that seems like the most plausible case. I think that's the word. Scenario. They're all dead, I believe. I mean, the boy had to have been born at home and never accounted for. I don't want to use the word registered because yeah. fingerprints and footprints didn't show up in any hospital records. And if he'd been born at a hospital, there would be some sort of record. I think that's the weirdest part of the whole thing is the fact that there is no record of him. So he also refused to take a lie detector test. Yep. And it sounds like the detective believed that he had found the killers. Yeah, the Bristow that took it upon himself to start investigating it, he believed fully that the Nicolettis were involved somehow, but the police were like, eh, I don't think so. Is this true? When his wife died, he ended up marrying his stepdaughter? Yeah, that's what I'd read. 
And it could have been possible that the baby was him and Anna's. Mm hmm. That is messed up. Because Anna Marie was his wife's daughter from a previous relationship. Right. And supposedly she was handicapped in some way. And that's that was a big theory is that he raped her and she got pregnant with the boy. Obviously, the boy lived for a few years. They didn't just kill him after she yeah. gave birth, but they didn't take care of him, obviously. Clearly. I feel but like the, if that was the case, they didn't care for him properly because he was a bastard, quote-unquote, child. Yeah, and he had a lot of health issues. So they just were like, we just neglect you. Yep. And that also kind of bugs me. I don't know exactly what the hospital's protocol is when a child comes in as a new patient. I kind of know how that works now. But back then, he had to have gone to a hospital at some point because of the cut down uh, scars. Unless they and did those at home. I was just like, unless they were at home where they had a doctor come into the house. Yeah, like a family friend or something. Yeah, things like that did happen more often back then than they do now. So it's possible. I mean, out of all the theories, that seems like the most accurate. Yeah. Um, because of the pond and the rim, the blankets that had been cut in half to fit the children's cots. They kept foster kids. And I know that's kind of cliche of foster families beating their kids, the foster kids, but. Right. I mean, they kept like five or six kids at one time. It was the 50s. They. Yeah. Yeah. I just hate that it's still unsolved. And that they. If it was the Nickelodeons, they got away with it. Mm hmm I'd say pretty much whoever did it has gotten off scot-free at this point. Which is just horrible. Absolutely horrible. You would think with that level of neglect and disrespect and mutilation... That, that wouldn't have been their first or last time doing something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the fact that the doctor, they didn't even interview the doctor that examined the boy or the children of the Nicolettis. Yeah. Like, that doesn't make any sense to me. Same here. I mean, we've said it before. A lot of the issues with some of these unsolved cases is police neglect. That was the one that we were talking about when you were over here the other day about how the family walked through the house. Oh, John Bonet. Yeah, that one. That one's just. Mm hmm. Makes me so frustrated. Irritates me to no end. Like, seriously. I don't care if the family's being annoying or not. Tell them to shut up and sit down. Right? It's like, I don't care if you have money or no money. Uh, if it's a crime scene, you need to stay out of it. Yep. Now, if they invite you into the crime scene to show them something, that's different. Yeah, but they need to be, the police need to be the ones involved in the crime scene. You don't let other people who isn't trained in the art of crime scene forensics to just traipse about. Exactly. Drives me crazy. I mean, it's one thing when you're searching for somebody out in the wilderness and you get together volunteers to help search but they're told you see the body you just call us don't touch it and nothing like what call your quadrant leader or whatever they call them yeah so many of the cases that we've talked about and we're going to talk about cops and family members just drop the ball mm -hmm. I don't know maybe we're expecting too much out of these professionals <laughs> maybe <laughs> but I mean, the professional, so you kind of, hmm. yeah. 
But like, I feel like the only person who cared about the boy in the end was the detective. Yeah. Like, the, he was the, the only one who didn't stop. Until he died. Yeah. And, like, that is just heartbreaking on so many levels because he just couldn't get past it. I, I mean, I get it because it bugs me. It bugs me. Yeah. I don't understand how they couldn't identify them. I don't understand how we have people out there that bodies are found and they can't be identified, especially when they're in the shape that this boy was in. It yeah, wasn't like, like he, decomposed beyond recognition. Right? He was still and like, intact. I mean, and of course their technology wasn't as good back then as it is now, but they still had better technology than they did in like other cases we've talked about. Yeah. And, I mean, like, the fact that there's no, I can't find out who he was makes me think they never took him to, like, a hospital or some place where he would be registered. So I feel like yeah. if they had, then they'd have been able to identify him by dental records and stuff. Yeah. he He's obviously during the time he was alive, and I don't remember how old they guesstimated his age to be as to when he died, because with his health... That was kind of hard to figure out. Yeah. Uh, but during his short life, he was never taken to a legitimate doctor who legitimately did their job the way they were supposed to. Exactly. So under the table type of, we'll pay you for this if you just keep your mouth shut and don't document it. Which is just disgusting, in my opinion. And what I... Happened to do no harm? I mean, I would say... It was a different time, so that's why they did it. But I wouldn't put it past some shady people to still do crap like that now. Oh, no. 102% they still do stuff crap like that. And that's just... That's what's so scary about the world. Is you have people out there like that. But it's nothing new. They, yep. They've always been there. Yep. We're just now more, more aware of it. But are we trying to do anything to stop them? No. Nope. I don't feel like we are personally we got some jacked up priorities and then we're like i don't understand how kids get killed like that whale <laughs> exactly what were you worried about last <laughs> week karen oh my god like i know i say a lot of times you do you i'll do me i won't worry about what you're doing you don't worry about what i'm doing but this is different. Like, if I see you doing something to hurt somebody, I'm not just going to look the other way. Yeah. I may not I mean, tackle you because I'm not <laughs> stupid. I'll call the police, but. And that's the thing. You know, you do what you want to do. You live your own life as long as you're not hurting anybody. Yeah. But, like, just don't cross that line of hurting anybody and we're yep. good. But what makes me so worried about how with things nowadays is a lot of people are going to have to go back alleys to get things done. And a lot of people are going to take advantage of that. And a lot of people are going to get hurt. Yep. Just like it was in the 50s. <laughs> yep. We're regressing back to the 50s. That's just great. Hey, we started out the 20s like the 1920s with a plague. So <laughs> you got it. <laughs> Might as well. Lord. Fashions come and go and then they come back again and turns out so does social justice. Apparently. Well, I'd be okay if some of the styles came back and stayed back. Oh yeah, styles. There, there's some fun styles. I mean, I think at this point there's not a defined style. We just it's a conglomeration. Pretty much, yeah. But I mean, that's probably, what do, you, what do you think, you think that's probably like one of the bit, most famous unsolved cases in America? Say that again? Do you think that's one of the most famous unsolved cases in America is the boy in the box? I don't think it's the most famous. Um, because I hadn't really heard about it until I started, you know, researching stuff for the show. Right. And then I came across it. But it is, um, to me, one of the most famous unsolved cases would be the John Benet Ramsey one. Yeah. But that might have been 
because I was alive during the time that that started. Uh, then there's the Zodiac Killer that I think is more famous than this one was. This one I think is very oh, niche. Yeah, I forget that Zodiac was never solved for some reason. <laughs> I think I feel the boy in the box is more niche to the people who have like I've I've done John Bonet, I've done Zodiac Killer. Let's this where we're gonna dig deeper into you know more small town type things that uh, people don't know about. Yeah, but there is a whole website. And it's got a buttload of information on it that would take us forever to suss through. Probably. For sure. But the images of him are so disturbing. Not the fact that he's like, looks grisly or anything like that, but just because it's a dead boy being posed in a seated, normal position to try to get people to be like, oh yeah, know him. Yeah, that's disturbing. <laughs> but I mean, you gotta do what you gotta do, I guess. Yeah. Can you imagine, like, opening your power bill and having that image, like, greet you? <laughs> you scream, is the bill that high this week, Floyd? Nope, there's a dead boy in it. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Oh, Lord. Like, if they didn't warn them or have a note on it, like, there's like, is this what's going to happen if I don't pay the bill on time now? Apparently. How do you feel like either they probably warned people and people didn't pay attention or they just forgot? Yeah. Like, I would be the one who forgot. That would be me. <laughs> and if most of that family is dead now and the detective he was looking into, it's gone, That they're never going to open it back up. I mean, technically, I guess it's not closed. Um, True. But, I mean, at this point, the only, I think, the only other way they could get more information or evidence is to possibly re exhume the body because we have yeah. more technology now than what they did in the 50s. But it's also had 50 plus years, 60 plus years of decomp. Yep. What can you get from that? Who knows? They'll probably get something, but I don't think it would be admissible in court. Especially since it seems like a lot of people handled the body. I don't know. I mean, the only evidence that wouldn't be destroyed by age too much would be the blankets and stuff like that if they kept it, which they normally keep. Yeah. Evident ever. Until a building burns down or something, yeah. Oh yeah, that, that comes up in some cases. <laughs> Did it come up in this one? Didn't like somebody burn the files? Yep. The uh, wife of the medical examiner that examined the foster children when uh, the Nicolettis were implicated in the case, uh, when he died, his wife burned all the case files. I'm like, why? Your husband worked, obviously, with the police force. You have to think, well, they might need these files at some point again. Unless she was trying to hide something. Well, that's... Fire is a great way to hide something. Yep. That would be my choice <laughs> of hiding things. Yeah, same here. Yeah, there's just, there's just so much about these cases that just... Would have been better if people just did as they were told. And then it begs the question, if this happened today, would it have turned out differently? Maybe. Hopefully. But I mean, knows? I would like to say that if it happened today, we would at least be able to figure out who the boy was. Exactly. I can say that. I can't say that with certainty. <laughs> but it would be nice to know who he was. Yeah. And that would give some places to look for a suspect. Exactly. <laughs> like, I think that's what's so sad is like in a lot of these cases, sometimes the people aren't identified. Yep. Yeah. I still think it's crazy on some, uh, like, 
murder victims who can't be identified, aside from the ones that are so messed up that you can't even recognize they're human, um, like how did they? How can they still not figure out who they are when we have fingerprints and footprints and dental records? Because most people are going to have gone to the doctor or somewhere. Yeah. Some- like I could understand not having fingerprints and all that stuff. Like if you're not in a system that requires you to have fingerprints, but at least dental records. Yeah, and they take a footprint of babies born in the hospital at least. True. But when the foot chain as it grows? Our fingerprints don't, as our hand grows. That's true, so your footprint wouldn't either. You would think. Yeah, you would think. <laughs> but, like, people use it as an excuse, like, oh, he was just a homeless person or drug user or whatever. I'm like, but still, why can't you identify him? I said, you're still a person. Yeah, is it that you can't or that you just don't want to waste don't your want time? To. Yeah. Don't think they're important. Like, there's been, like, so many, like, dramatized shows I watch and stuff, like, where there's a homeless man and ends up he's actually somebody important just down on his luck. Like, how would you feel, like, if there's a famous person, got killed, you didn't care, the family found out you didn't care, and then there you were. (laughs) I could see that happening. (laughs) I could think of a couple of celebrities that could die, and I'm like, eh. Oh, you mean turd? <laughs> Neighbor turd? Oh, man. Oh, unsolved mysteries, man. They drive me crazy. Huh. Yep. Even some solved ones are annoying. Because you're like, why? Why did you have to kill them? Exactly. All right. So, anything else to say, or shall we nope. wrap it up? We can wrap it up if you wish, my dear. All right. Thank you for tuning in. I'll see you next week. Make sure you check us out on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, stay spooky, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>